James looked across the giant table in front of him. An enormous tablecloth covered it, as an immaculate plain of pure white, laying there like an undisturbed layer of fresh snow. A laughably high chair, worthy of a diving board, had been brought for him so he could even reach up to the colossal plate of the Leader Supreme's dinner table. It was the first time in a long while that he was sitting in the chair to eat, yet it brought him no comfort. Apparently this high society meeting considered itself too good to have people sitting on the tables, like it was custom in the entire rest of the galactic community. The room did its best to reinforce that notion, as there was no sign of the blank walls of cold metal so characteristic for any spacebound vessel anywhere. Every square centimetre of the room was clad in some form of dark wood or colourful cloth, giving the spacious room an elegant yet almost antiquated feeling. Of course, just as was the case with the Matriarch's office building, the red carpet was not missing here either. The same was the case with various statues, although these examples seemed to show actual works of art instead of pompous depictions of core welders. The decoration also continued onto the tables, as huge, elaborately woven cubes made thick, rattan-like material adorned each table. Some held vases or pots with flowers within them, others candle holders. Apparently no decoration could go without a woven container. As his eyes wandered across the table once more, they inevitably landed right in front of him. The shinily polished cutlery that had already been placed for him when he arrived was different from the ones he was used on Earth. It consisted only of a fork and a spoon. The fork was long and thin with only two tiny prongs at the end and reminded him of a fondue fork, while the spoon also had a long handle but ended in a deepened, very rounded head like that of a portioning spoon. Looking slightly to the right of him, to the only other person sitting on a mountain of a chair like he was, he had a pretty good idea whose trunk, covered mouth these instruments were made for originally. Looking a lot like James felt, Reprieve didn't seem all too comfortable while sitting at a table with the galaxy's elite. That or he was just afraid of heights. The small man was constantly licking his trunk and also had trouble holding his hand still, while he constantly surveyed the room for any threat his nervous mind could conjure up. The rest of their company emanated a more relaxed aura, although even their done-it-all demeanour was intermittently disrupted by side glances or an unusual movement of their face. The more normally sized people at the table all sat on more sensibly looking chairs, although they still looked a bit awkward next to the sheer size of the Zodatios sized table. Of course, some adaptations in each chair's design have been necessary to accommodate for the different body forms, which is why they were usually scrapped in the community at large in the first place. While the captain's seat looked a lot like a chair James would know from Earth, if a bit large and misshapen, the seat of the chair of Councilman Kashalengas had to be positioned at an angle for him to be able to come to position his shell and tail, and what Councilman Akorte was sitting on could hardly even be called a chair. It was more of a couchette he could lie on with his entire body, his limbs hanging off the sides, and at least two of his hands positioned towards the table. Lastly, James's eyes slowly rose up, looking at the person right across from him. Even the matriarch only reached over the massive table from her long neck upwards, while half kneeling, half lying next to it. With her head now being a lot closer to James's level, its colossal sires got a lot clearer. That was especially true for her four tusks, each of which dwarfed James as they hovered only slightly above the table's plate. The only one coming even close to rivaling her sheer presence was, of course, her niece, sitting right next to the maid shark, but from this new elevated position, the size difference between even the two titans was noticeable. Ajafianora still had some growing to do if she wanted to fill the metaphorical shoes of her aunt. All things considered, James felt like a puppet, placed on the kitchen table to participate in the meal by an imaginative child. The clean end for a space station remarkably fresh air in the spotless room had a strange heaviness to it, and he longingly thought back to the smoky air, awful music and cold, hard table of the Gouviat Shade. And even more than that, he longed for the company of that night. Even the rowdy Tonamstra site would make for a welcome guest right now. He honestly wondered if one of the many Tonamstra site ambassadors he knew from the news networks had ever been or even would ever be invited to this very table. Somehow he doubted it, even though he had to admit that that might have been his personal bias against his host speaking. I hope you do not mind the moment of wait. 
The matriarch's voice suddenly broke the silence, as she waved her trunk across the table, making James jerk upright. He had summed down a bit as he got lost in thought. I wanted to ensure that you get your first taste of our local delicacies in their freshness and most delectable form. Putting on his best toothless smile while the shiver crept across his back, James waved off the concerns of the matriarch. I don't mind at all, he said in a calm manner and gesticulated with his right hand, mimicking Madame Tour's trunk movement to the best of his ability. Among humans, patience is a virtue, and all good things need their time. It wasn't a lie. James didn't really mind the wait. What he did mind a lot more was that the matriarch had committed her second party foul of their meeting, as she had apparently chosen what he would be eating for him before they had even arrived. On Earth, even the worst service would give you at least two options to choose from. For a moment he wondered if it was possible that she had done so in order to prevent him from ordering anything containing meat and ruining her appetite. This in turn made him wonder what the menu of a place like this would even look like. Did they even serve meat around here? His eyes fell on the councilman of Corte for a moment. His species was clearly what James would identify as an amphibian. And on Earth, amphibians were, with the exception of some tadpoles, exclusively carnivorous. Although by now he should probably have learned that, while humans usually use their Earth terms as translation for the strange, purely phenotypical ordering the galaxy at large was using to categorize its species, that wasn't always the most accurate, and every now and then led to some wrong assumptions. After all on Earth, the primate species that at least semi-regularly consume meat outnumbered the completely vegan ones, while such a thing was unheard of in the rest of the galaxy. A fine thing to hear, that even people with such short lives know how important it is to take their time. Korodish mused, rubbing the loose, leathery skin of his neck with two of his long claws. That turned him a disapproving look of Ajifianora, who was sitting to his left. Apparently she was the only one around seeing the poorly veiled problem in confronting someone with a statement such as that one. From the opposite side of the table, Councilman Akorte now also spoke up. Beginning from their very youth, his people spent an enormous portion of their time focusing on nothing but learning. With only as much as one standard year of age, most of them have already finished more than half of their basic education. It is safe to say that humans have learned to use the time given to them effectively, he explained to his cohort. Somebody had done his homework, and very different from his previous behaviour, his tone sounded almost reverent, or maybe it was more warning. But the old reptile just chuckled his croaking chuckle, and almost nostalgically replied, Quite exemplary. Truly a shining example of primate kind, those humans. Quite! Captain Uchon agreed with the councilman, and threw an encouraging look over towards James. Although James awkwardly smiled back at the large man, the remark had missed his mark. And not only James had a hard time going along with the narrative the people at the table were creating around humans. Repri just could not help himself and make a depreciatory sound, something James could very much sympathise with right now, even if his reasons were most likely different. He had no problem imagining the shining example of primate kind not quite matching up with the picture Reprieve had developed of humanity after witnessing James's exploits firsthand. The talk was interrupted by the door to the kitchen opening and waiters stepping out to deliver their dinner. The portions for the matriarch and her niece were so enormous that only another Zoditos could effectively carry them and they were served in nearly swimming pool sized bowls or maybe buckets, was better fitting as a description of the deep containers, allowing James no insight into what they had ordered for themselves. The other trays and plates were bought by a variety of Corwalder waiters, as they were for most part too small to be sensibly carried by one of the Titans. The service personnel used the same half stairs half ladders that the attendees had used to get on top of their chairs before to deliver their food. Among the dishes, James noticed an abundance of meaty, legume-like fruits, making up many of the main courses. He figured this was where the vegan species of many players got the proteins necessary for their big brains from. His own dish, bought by a nervous-looking young member of the same species as the guard who had so clumsily mishandled the pepper spray during the security's training exercise, also consisted mainly of thick, oily, bean-like fruits, prepared along with a variety of root vegetables. He really hoped the dish was more appetising than it looked. While he usually didn't spurn a vegan meal option, he also had to admit to himself that he was a bit childish when it came to the prospect of eating exclusively vegetables. Bon appetit, 
James mumbled, after you thanked the waiter and was ready to at least start to eat out of courtesy. He didn't wait for an answer, as people were already starting to eat all around him, and carefully skewered one of the dark things with the strange long fork. Taking a first bite, it didn't taste bad. It was pretty fatty and hearty, and luckily not as flavourless as he would have expected from a giant bean. Although he didn't enjoy the mealy consistency it turned to, after he chewed it for a bit at all. Maybe he was a bit spoiled when it came to food. I do hope it meets your taste, Madame Tua commented across the table between mouths full of some sort of thick leaves she shoveled into her mouth, with what was basically an oversized pitchfork. If that is the case, you should have let me make my own order, James thought pertly to himself, although he managed to keep up a more agreeable facade outwardly. I have certainly had worse, he answered, not wanting to appear too flattering, especially since he wasn't sure if he could hide his unhappy expression with each bite he took. Keeping in line with his straightforward approach to things, Councilman Accorte now directly addressed James, lifting his head slightly off his cachet to look directly over to him. I wonder, say, could your people survive in a diet like this? He asked, his voice remaining in a very matter-of-fact tone. It is quite a bit different from what you would usually consume on your homeworld, after all. He left the obvious implications of his question quite vague, and James wondered if that was out of discretion or appreciation. James took time with chewing and swallowing a bite of food before he answered, raising one finger towards the councilman to indicate for him to wait. After also taking a sip of water to rinse his throat, James finally replied, Most likely we could. There are already people on Earth living with an entirely vegan diet, and fruits like these are most likely a welcome diversification for them. The face of a corte seemed to relax to attention James had not noticed was there once he heard that. I had expected as much, but finding confirmation for it proved to be difficult, he said, and his tone also slightly relaxed. Many sources in your network were shown to be quite contradictory on the topic. I can imagine, James replied awkwardly, and put down his fork for a moment while talking, not too unhappy to have an excuse to not continue eating for a bit. It is still a very polarising subject for many humans, and everyone wants their own pre built opinion to be the right one, so they either demonise the vegan diet or praise it into all heavens. Fact is, with today's technology, it neither has a detrimental nor a beneficial effect on our health. It is simply a lifestyle decision. Not surprising. Councilman Cachalangas commented in a strangely satisfied tone. There are primates, after all. This only goes to show, no matter the circumstances, an honourable life will never be more than two claws worth of digging away from them. The people surrounding him noticed quickly that his choice of words had been a poor one, as the mood of the room shifted, and some aghast and disapproving glances were thrown at the old man. And this time even James could not and did not want to remain silent on the matter. Changing his tone to a rather unhappy one for the first time during the meeting, and combining it with an admittedly rather predatorial look towards the reptile, James responded, I would highly prefer it if you did not label the way my people and many others live naturally as dishonourable, Councilman. The old man's mouth stood open for a moment as he wordlessly looked back at James with a strange, unreadable expression. Quickly, the matriarch intervened, seemingly rushing to the Councilman's aid. I am sure he did not mean to insult you, James, she said conciliatorily, and waved her trunk trying to calm him, which had the exact opposite of the intended effect. As much as he wanted to, he couldn't quite muster the courage to directly oppose the matriarch on this, the heavy leftover feeling of fear in the back of his mind rearing his ugly head. However, help arrived from an unlikely source, as someone unexpected backed him in his outrage. Well, he did it anyway. Aja Fionora spoke up, looking at her aunt sternly. We shouldn't let a councilman get away with stuff like that so easily. They are supposed to be better than that. Maybe he had judged the girl prematurely, James thought. There seemed to be the spark of a leader within her. Clearly surprised that someone would directly step up to her like that, Madame Tua looked at her niece in disregard. However, she soon noticed all eyes around the table being glued to their exchange, especially the distrustful gaze of James. Her expression quickly changed as she turned towards her niece, again taking up her conciliatory tone. Of course, you are right, dear she said, and James could clearly pick up on the disgruntled undertone beneath her sweet demeanour. She turned her attention towards the councilman, who observed the whole situation seemingly quite lost. Kashalangas, you should know better than to slip up like that. You should apologise to James. I'm sure he will forgive you this time if you do. Her choice of words left something to be desired, found James. The scolding tone in her voice seemed a bit misdirected as well, putting emphasis on all the wrong things in that sentence. 
Either way, the old man looked back and forth between the matriarch and James with a lost expression for some time. I'm sorry, he finally said, once his eyes had settled on James for some time. His voice was crackly and sounded quite unsure, almost confused as he spoke, making the apology sound sincere on one hand, but misguided on the other. I never imagined you would take offence to that. It was James's turn now. Diplomatically speaking, it would be best to let this one mess up slide. Accept the excuse and let bygones be bygones. However, James's more spiteful side heavily protested that idea despite his better judgement. Only when the captain sitting to his left spoke up was James slowly pulled out of his hesitation. Forgive the old boy, James, but do me that favour, please, the large primate said sincerely. I can vouch for the fact that he would never willingly offend you. Apparently there was quite a bit of cognitive dissonance between James and the other attendees here. His problem had very little to do with the old man's intent, and a lot to do with the very basis of his statement. However, raising a huge stink about it right here, right now, would probably help no one, as much as he disliked it. Alright, I'll cave, he said with a sigh, relaxing his posture and expression. <laughs> but only because it's you, Captain. Thank you, James, Captain Uton said, in the most relieved tone James had ever heard out of him. I'm sure it won't happen again. James waited off as he returned his attention forward again. Making sure she was looking at him, he gave Ajifianora an acknowledging nod, thanking her for having his back. The tidying was hard to read, but he felt like he had gotten the message across. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed that Kashalangas may have looked relieved about his forgiveness as well. However, he still seemed no less lost about the situation, even after it was resolved. He stared down at his plate, his eyes almost glazing over as he seemed to lose himself in thought. Either trying to salvage the situation, or simply wanting to get everything he wanted to say out before it was too late, it was Cousin Corte who picked up the conversation back up. Well, from what I have read, humans are quite flexible beings when it comes to their living arrangements, he stated, and James wondered just how much he had read about humanity. Then again, as a councilman, it wasn't too strange that he would be interested in such a massive addition to his community. I'm sure they will adapt to the circumstances surrounding them in the community in no time. That much was true. When push came to shove, humans would make do. Although changing the humans' habits was probably quite a bit harder than a court he imagined, based on just the raw data. And a sideways glance from a priest showed that he was not the only one having that thought. If he was honest, he was quite surprised how well the warrant officer seemed to get humanity by now, at least if his interpretation of the man's reactions was accurate. Then again, that was possibly part of his job. It may still take some time until the community's status quo sinks in with humanity. They are quite reclusive after all. Madame Tour rejoined the conversation, putting on her sickly sweetest tone as she talked and raising her trunk to sway its halves, accompanying her speech. However, I see it just as you, Accorte. Once humanity spreads out into the community at large, they'll surely become a marvellous member species. At this time, James was getting sick of flattery, especially since it all seemed so strangely underhanded to him. Then again, would anything politicians said while executing their duty not seem underhanded? Still, what she said did make him think. The general status quo, what would that be? Distrust of other death orders, maybe? Or at least death world predators? Along with an ingrained respect for the revered orders, the aversion of cybernetics was definitely part of it as well, and possibly also nudism? Was that a step too far? Maybe vacuum phobia? Then again, that could be more nature than nurture. Also apparently a preference for a vegan diet. Even with humanity adapting, he didn't see most of those happening within big parts of it. This also made him wonder how many of these things were around in other species before they joined the community. He could imagine that the culture of member species would over time change and adapt to more closely resemble that of the general community. But just how much? What about people that didn't adapt as well as others? There were some laws members had to follow as part of the community, however none of those encompassed any of the mentioned things. Well, except for maybe... Unity in the community, he mumbled to himself, for a moment forgetting the situation he was in in soulfulness. Quite right, Captain Uton responded happily, apparently wildly misinterpreting James's mumbling. It may be a bit of a rocky start for humanity given your circumstances, but you'll have that figured out in no time, and then you'll be heading straight towards prime membership in the galactic community. Prime membership, status quo, adaption, unity. All of these words bust around in James's head for a while as he sat there. He quickly picked his fork back up and started eating the now significantly cooler meal in front of him, using it as an excuse to not reply for a bit. He was no stranger to the prospect of unity. 
It was even one of the three virtues as home proclaimed in its national anthem. However, there it went along with and was balanced by right and freedom. A balance that he felt to be quite important in one way or the other. And something that was missing in the community's motto. Then again, how much weight could he actually put on something like an inspirational little motto that seemed to be rarely even used? Maybe he was being a bit paranoid here. It wouldn't have been the first time. However, if he followed this train of thought, some things he had witnessed suddenly began to make a whole lot more sense. He decided to put things at least slightly to the test. Well, I don't know. So far I mostly seem to freak people out, he replied, and put a bit of emphasis on the word freak, just enough to be the slightest bit noticeable. While doing so, he threw a challenging look over to Reprieg, who had remained in the background so far. Reprieg twitched for a moment when he realised he was being addressed. However, he quickly let out a long breath and regained his composure. Well, your behaviour can be a bit off, but it is nothing that couldn't be worked out, the warrant officer admitted hesitantly, carefully picking his words since James and him had only ever officially met Thrice, and only very briefly. And as far as Reprieg knew, those were the only times James could be thinking about now. However, James also noticed the man throwing glasses towards the major, as he carefully picked his words. Although your particular choice of company certainly doesn't help with that. James was a bit surprised that he would say it so bluntly, but it wasn't untrue. The demeanour of people surrounding him changed drastically depending on the company he was in. By now he suspected it depended on whether the people he was with more invoked his primate, or his default image, with their presence. Right, you've grown quite fond of Uton's protégé, haven't you? Madame Tua commented in a strange tone James couldn't quite place. What was her name again? Petty Officer First Class Shida, James quickly answered, making sure to use her full title for a change. And yes, yeah, she and I are quite close. A bit of an understatement, but he decided to leave it at that. Around here, it wasn't really anybody's business. Well, maybe the captain's, but he could talk to him in private later. Next to him, he could hear Utong clear his throat, and out of the corner of his vision, he saw the large man nervously scoot around in his seat. Rumour among your shipmates has it that you have been quite successful in taming her down, Councilman Acorte said, joining the conversation once again. His many eyes focused on James as his body heavily rose up and settled down with each breath he took while laying down. Acorte realised quicker than his contemporary before him that he had chosen his words poorly, and he quickly corrected himself by adding, What I mean is that she has gotten quite a bit more sociable since she joined the crew, of course. I hear she was a bit of a rascal before. A respectable save, found James. You strangely seem to like a courtier in a twisted way. He at least seemed to be very upfront with his intentions when compared to the other people present here. James brought a hand to his chin as he answered. I guess you could say that. In reality, Sheeta hasn't changed all that much since he had come around. He had just presented an opportunity for her to talk to people without them instantly trying to avoid her, and maybe gotten her to be a little less spiteful in places. The people who had really gotten more sociable were those who he had almost forced to actually interact with her. I assure you, Shida is not bad company, Captain Uton chimed in, nervously fidgeting with his hands. What had got him so riled up? She's a dutiful member of my crew and a hard worker, and she has made the best out of her circumstances. A bit of an awkward silence broke out, during which most eyes were directed at Uton. Most notable were a very confused look from Ajifianora, was presumably the only person with no idea who they were talking about, as well as another puzzling look from her aunt. Surprisingly, Uton's nervousness also had the effect of pulling Councilman Kashlangas out of his own thoughts. The old man turned towards his longtime friend and made some encouraging gestures towards him. Thinking that enough was enough, James decided to have his bosses back for a change as well. There, there, Captain, he said, putting on a very deliberate casual tone. I'm sure no one here was suggesting anything in that direction, right? Just as deliberately, he turned towards Reprieg, bringing the burden of the conversation back to the warrant officer, who had so carelessly brought up James's friends. Their company seemed to interestingly eye the interaction between the two Death Worlders, as James had engaged the syphilis lung directly for the second time now. Reprieg quickly combed through the fur in his face with his hands a few times, avoiding James's gaze as he stared him down. She's not unsalvageable. He finally admitted, still not returning James's gaze, while his trunk wildly moved as he talked. She is effective in her line of duty. Feeling pretty validated, James smiled at the critter and nodded, turning towards the captain, planning to swap some encouraging words with his fellow primate. However, the warrant officer wasn't quite done yet, and just couldn't help himself and mumble something under his breath. Even so, that still leaves the app. He murmured into his trunk. 
Not intending on just letting him finish that sentence, James immediately shot back around to him, and this time Reprieve wasn't fast enough in looking away. His eyes meeting James with a surprised stare. The what? James said, overly friendly, and suddenly exposed his teeth in a faint grin as he spoke. I didn't catch that. Could you speak up? Reprieve's head jerked backwards as James' intense stare hit him. The... the cyborg! Reprieve stared a bit louder. Even the more innocent depictions seemed to cause an almost immediate change of mood at the table. Cyborg? Ajifionora asked, this time apparently not satisfied with just sitting there not knowing what was being discussed. James turned towards her, making sure to hide his teeth again, when he gave her a more honest smile. My friend, Curie, he explained, putting a bit of excitement into his voice. You should meet them sometime, they're great, although I admit they take some getting used to. It was almost funny, the way the councilman looked at him now. It was as if he had made the girl an immoral offer right there at the dinner table. As most times, the matriarch managed to hide her feelings a bit better, not cracking her sweet facade with an indignant reaction. The girl herself reacted surprisingly candidly, merely stating, Well, if you say so, guess they can't be too bad if you think so highly of them. While once again waving both halves of her trunk in a way that James by now started to interpret as a shrug-like gesture for Zodiatos. And apparently he really should have given the girl more credit. Either that or she was a much better actress than anyone else at the table. Obviously their remaining company operated under the rule of if you have nothing nice to say, say nothing at all at that moment, deciding to just leave it be with that statement. Presumably they were very much interested in not upsetting James any further than he had apparently already been. This started the second bout of awkward silence at the table, as most of the attendees seemed to struggle to find a suitable topic to pick the conversation back up. The one finally succeeding was Captain Uton, who seemed to calm himself in the meantime, seeing as the topic of his protégé was now over. Stroking his first move of his big hands, the large man said, Yes, but those aren't the only friends James has made on board. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who doesn't, at the very least, get along with him. Well, that someone is sitting right here at the table with us, James thought to himself, and cracked a smile at his snide remark that only he could hear. I wonder, is it the same among your people? Madame Tua thought out loud and focused on James, giving him goosebumps. At this point, he wasn't even sure if it was out of fear or just the sheer intensity of her gaze. Are you a people person, or are just humans just naturally good at making friends? James chuckled awkwardly and rubbed the back of his head. Well, I never had any trouble getting along with people, although I can't really say I'm a people person, he replied. I find interaction with non-humans much easier somehow. Well, usually that was. This whole interaction was everything but easy. Nothing that can't be learned. Kashalenga said, speaking out for the first time again after a long bit of silence. A few tweaks here and there and they'll be eating right out of your hand. The old man chuckled to himself, making his long neck sway around in his amusement. James looked at him confusedly. I don't think that'll be necessary, he replied, while raising a single eyebrow at the reptilian. I'm a scientist, not a politician. I like to convince with facts and results, not with fancy words. No offence. None taken. Akute dryly replied from the other side of the table, sounding almost like he agreed with James. Of course, of course, Kashalenkas continued, and conciliatorily raised an arm to wave off James's inquiry. I was only speaking in hypotheticals. Forgive an odd man. Sometimes my mouth is faster than my mind. Well, it was much easier to forgive him for this than for his other comment. But you do have to admit, you are in quite the unique position, James, Balantua said, and gesticulated with her laughably big piece of cutlery in one half of her trunk. You have lived in the community for a good while now. You have come into deeper contact with it than presumably any other one of your kind. Won't your people be interested in what you, as some with direct experience, has to say? Won't they want you to guide them onto a good path towards a smooth integration into community, as someone who is walking it himself? James always laughed at that. With all due respect, ma'am, he responded, and looked right into the matriarch's monstrous eyes. I doubt many people will give a damn about what I have to say. For most of them, life hasn't changed much since we joined the community, and due to Earth being Earth, it probably won't change much in the future either. Sure, they see off-worlders in the media every now and then, and there may be some new training done, but all in all, most of them will still go to work the same way, they will still go home the same way, and overall, they will live the same way. For most humans, it doesn't matter too much what is going on in the great picture, since only very little of that trickles all the way down to them. And for the people at the top, who do care about stuff like that. I am just some random scientist. I don't have what it takes to make those people listen to me. They will have their own idea about integration and follow that, which is probably a good idea since they know a lot more about stuff like this than I do. 
It was probably the most honest thing he had said all night. So what you are saying is people would need a reason to listen to you, the Leeds Supreme summarised, apparently coming to a very different conclusion than James about what his little speech was meant to convey. He also did absolutely not like her undertone. However, said undertone vanished when she seemingly stabbed right back into her sugary demeanour and quickly asked, Tell me, James, even if they don't listen, what would you be telling humanity about the Galactic community should the topic ever come up? James, who could at this point only assume that this meeting was a way to get him involved in their electoral campaign somehow, replied carefully. Well, it's a bit odd and rough around the edges, and there are some things in place that just don't agree with us humans, but all in all, it's got his heart in the right place, and if we are willing to put some work into it, I'm sure we'll find a way to smooth things out in time. Ha <laughs> Captain Uton laughingly asked to that, raising his glass. Quickly, the table joined in with him, also raising their glasses and echoing back at him. Hear, hear. James could feel himself turn red and lowered his head. Maybe he shouldn't have gotten so philosophical. This toast basically marked the end of their dinner, and while he had not gotten much out of them, his warriors had at least been slightly eased. They were politicians close to a big election, so it seemed they were merely out to try and gain every advantage they could with a large new group of voters. Although this nagging feeling about his theories regarding the community's unity were still eating away at the back of his mind. They finished their meals, and since it was a business meeting first and foremost, they did not bother with many niceties afterwards, leaving the table in a timely fashion. The entire group escorted him outside, and while they walked, clear signs of fatigue started to show on many of them. Only himself and Rapri seemed to be just as fit as when they had started today's guided tour. The Zodaitos seemed to at least somewhat keep it together, but everyone else appeared to be just about ready to collapse into bed. Therefore, goodbyes were held to a minimum, everyone only giving brief parting words to each other. When it came to saying goodbye to Ajifionora, James overcame himself for a moment, reaching out his hand towards her. She had more than proven that she deserved this, so he clenched his teeth and smiled at her, as she reached her massive trunk down towards him. The contact was brief, it was still enough to make him feel like he was about to break out in cold sweats, but somehow... It was a fair rewarding. Great things are ahead of us, I know it, was what Kashalenga said once James turned to him. Cryptic and strange as everything the old man had directed at him so far, James just awkwardly nodded at that. Maybe 96 years of service was a bit much, even for a long-lived species. Good day, Ambassador, was all a court I had for him, a sentiment that James all too happily returned. Don't be a stranger, Captain Uton once again said to him, softly patting his shoulder. Right back at you, James replied. He probably had something to discuss with the captain, and only the captain, anyway. Well, James, this has been quite the evening. Do not be surprised if I contact you again, the massive, looming matriarch said, as James had to throw his head all the way back to look up at her. He didn't quite know what to say. Something like, spare me, was the first thing that came to his mind. However, he thought better of it. I will try and keep a spot in my schedule free for you, James replied, trying to sound as businesslike as possible. With the prospect of getting away from her soon, the feeling of dread that he had banished into the far-off corners of his mind was starting to claw his way back, and he could feel himself getting a bit jittery. Then he turned, addressing everyone in their little round. It has been an honour, everyone, he said. And this time there was at least a kernel of truth in that. Success to you. Success to you, it echoed back at him, as he turned to leave. It had not gone past him that Rapriga had not yet shown any interest in exchanging parting words with him, and as he started to walk away from the group, Familiar first test walked after him. Although this time when he turned around to look at the man, Rapri just stood there, also coming to a halt, as he returned James's gaze. I have a bit of time until my next appointment. Do you mind if I accompany you for a bit of the way? The small man said, cocking his head sideways to more easily look at James. James looked at the rodent distrustfully, but decided as long as he was wearing his assistant, having or not having Rapri around didn't make all that much of a difference. But we had to wonder why the warrant officer would suddenly want to come along with him. He would only be able to get the answer to that on their way, he figured. Sure, he said, shrugging, and turned around again to continue on his way. But do try to keep up. I shouldn't have to wait for a fellow death worker after all. <laughs>